because there's, there's a few of us, I think we'll have the chance to do a bit of a check-in. So, uh, so welcome everybody um, to Citizen Network Key Action webinar. So we're coming up to, this is the third last webinar, which um, have all been really interesting. Thank you, Darren and Rosie, for coming on this morning. Um, and thanks, Steve, for joining us in the middle of the night. Um, in the middle of your night, anyway. Um, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia, the First People, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The other thing I just want to acknowledge tonight, and Steve, you may be really familiar with this, um, is that last night, or during our night, um, in the UK, there was a fairly significant documentary aired. Did you see it, Steve? Uh, no, I, um, I haven't seen it yet, um, but we'll be, we'll be seeing it in the next day or, or so. Yeah. Can you not hear me? Not working. Lost the sound. Um, was an undercover documentary, uh, something called Panorama, that went into yeah. um, an assessment and treatment service in the north of England and uncovered what I understand to be horrific torture, abuse of people with an intellectual disability yeah. and with autism, um, which I think has been an incredible um, tragedy um, that I know, you know, um, given that we're talking today about home, um, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that really and share our support with the people, families and everybody out there. Um, Okay, so like I say, today we're talking about home. So we've got Darren Ginelli um, from My Place, um, who, which is an organization that supports people in Western Australia with us. And then we've also got Rosie Lorne, who leads um, an organization called Avivo, which people will be familiar with on the call because there's quite a few of us here from Avivo. Um, and they're gonna be spending the hour or so with us, um, helping us think about the key home. Um, so let's do a bit of a quick check-in. So Rosie and Darren get to hear who's in the room. So I'll just call on people to keep us speedy. So I'm gonna start with you, Rachel, if that's okay. Sure. Um, hi everyone, I'm Rachel. Um, I am in Perth as well in WA and I work with Inclusion WA. Um, so my role is a mix of direct support with clients, but I'm also now leading um, a development of what we're calling our positive relationship services because I have a background in uh, relationship and sexuality education so um, yeah looking forward to the keys talk on love because that's probably fits in in with that nicely so yeah but hi everyone thanks Rachel okay Bev hello um, I think you all know who I am so um, with Avivo and uh, also Wace uh, assist with the admin for waste and um, very much part of this webinar and loving each different um, key that we uncover and explore and looking forward to today. Welcome Rosie and Darren. Great, thanks Bev. Bridget? Um, good morning, I'm Bridget. I'm the training manager at CamCam, Cam, which is an um, organisation that works in Perth as well. Um, and I am looking forward to the conversation around home because we are often supporting, well, only supporting people in their homes. So, and I continue to walk into homes with um, signs on the walls about behaviour. <laughs> kind of fascinating, fascinating. Thank you. Bridget, thanks Bridget. Jules? Well, I am home today, so I'm not very well, but um, I didn't want to miss this, so I'm, I'm zooming in. Um, I, I just really loved this whole series. I'm learning so much. Um, I'm actually, I, I work at Avivo too, um, in mental health, and I am doing my Bachelor of Social Work. One of the units I'm doing at the moment is Social Inclusion and Intellectual Disabilities, and I've just, yeah, it's been, it's been a lovely um, marriage of, of learning this semester, um, being able to do this webinar as well. So really looking forward to the topic today. Thanks, Jules. Katrina? 
Good morning, everybody. I'm Katrina from Avivo, also in Western Australia. <laughs> um, I work down in our Pill Coast area and I help support our customers and our teams to work in recovery with the people that we support in mental health. I too am absolutely loving this series. Um, I walk away every time with something else to think about and tease out and think about how in a very small way I can put some of the learnings into the work that we're actually doing um, down here in our community um, and I'm really interested in today because I've just recently had a, uh, a, a offer for a home for somebody that lives with me and I've been supporting for 10 years and we need to think about if actually this is the right time for her. Um, so yeah, I'm consulting with some different people around if, if she's ready to, to go out on her own. So you're really interesting today to hear from both you Darren and you Rosie about you know, your thoughts. Thanks. Fabulous, thanks Katrina. Steve? Hi, yeah, um, I'm, I'm Steve from the UK um, and uh, my main interest is researching citizenship for young people who have learning disabilities um, because it seems to me that some of the tragedies that we're currently experiencing in our services are because our, we're not really <coughs> aiming for the right thing in the first place. And so um, how we could get to act, active citizenship and uh, really uh, treat young people with the respect and opportunities they need is pretty crucial. Great, thanks, Steve. Okay, Darren, do you want to check in and just tell us a bit about you? Yes, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. And certainly, Rosie and I are feeling the pressure now. We're um, listening to those introductions. So... Hopefully we can um, share with you some of our thoughts and um, 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 considerations over today around home and citizenship and how that all links in together. So uh, thank you all for making the time, particularly you, Steve. I know it's probably late where you are, very late. So, but I certainly appreciate everyone joining us. Thank you. Great, thanks, Darren. Rosie? Um. Hi, everybody. It's uh, great to be here um, and I, uh really interested in how having this time to explore some of the thoughts about home and community and citizenship with you today it's um so fundamental i think and as you were saying i think all of you are touching on you know the history of our work with people with disabilities and mental health particularly their right to home has been so undermined in the past and and currently so look um i actually am quite envious i've listened to the one la uh, the, the keys last time and i thought the help key was really stimulating and i'm looking forward to in my own time having a look at it, some of the others so um yeah it's, it's it's great work so thank you all for your contribution it's um something that is um really important to our world today to be connecting up and collaborating about our thinking so looking forward to the next hour so great okay so if if it's okay with you uh, rosie and darren i'll just hand over um if you can just give us some sense of what you want the pace to be like so do you want us to, have you got time dedicated for questions or are you wanting more kind of we 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 share what we see as you're going, but what would work for you better just so we get a sense of how you want this to behave? Yeah, oh, well, I think um, we've, we've certainly got some slides to share with you with a couple of links, haven't we, Darren, yep. to some PowerPoints, but we will probably go through um, with some content. Um, it'd be great if you've got a particular thing though to raise it at the time, and maybe with the size of the group, we'll be able to handle that. Um, but we have got at one point a car, we have got some parts but we've got particular questions we'd like to kind of really check in with the group about what your thoughts are. Is that oh, fair okay. enough? Yeah, yeah. So, certainly it's not a, um, we're not delivering a lecture so today is very much about us all sharing. Rosie and I will share, we've, we've got a few slides to share and um, a few um, uh, videos and that at the end but certainly if people have, um, you know, thoughts and ideas as we go along, please contribute. It's about having an open discussion forum as we go through, so please contribute. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Okay then, so I'll hand over to you. I may just give you a kind of check-in about 10 past, quarter past 10, just mm. in case there are other topics that, we, that people may want to bring in, but yeah, go for it. Okay, so I'm just gonna try and get this PowerPoint up. So I press share, no? Yeah, if you go down to the bottom, press share. share. Yep. There we go. So we can see your desktop. 
<laughs> Watch out for all your emails, Darren. <laughs> as long as it's just emails. <laughs> so, the, 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 so everyone can see that slide now? Yep. Okay, yep. so so Rosie and I are going to do a bit of a, um, a tag team on this. So we just wanted to share with you some of um, um, our thoughts, um, some of our experience around home. And a lot of our focus today will be uh, generally about home, what it means for um, just citizens generally, but particular focus around some of the people that we support. So people that either have a, um, a disability, may have some mental health issues, or may have some ageing issues. So that's our experience from um, here in WA. So, so a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is based on um, how we support those people to achieve um, home ownership or certainly living in a home within the community. So, so what, what we want to try and cover today, um, we, we think we will, is um, what are some of the key themes around home? So understanding of home and its relationship to citizenship and community. Um, that having your own home is the foundation of living your life. So we, we see that as a critical um, lifestyle foundation so that people can live in their life, live in the community within and live their life within in the community. Um, we also recognise that home can come in many guises and be many different things to different people. So we'll talk a little bit about history um, and how home, um, a house doesn't necessarily mean it's a home. And, and, and a house and a home can come in many different sort of guises, if you like. And then for some of the citizens or some people that we support, choice does not come that uh, automatically or as easily achieved, in, particularly around home ownership. So, so we hope to cover off some of those, um, those things today. But first we thought we'd talk about us and um, you know, what, why, why, why do we have any expertise or experience in this area? So, um, so, Rosie, do you, do you want me to start or do you want to go first? Or? Uh, well, I'll go ahead now and say, okay. cool. um, look, um, yeah, it's interesting. When Kate said, oh, Rose, when we were putting together a webinar, oh, Rosie, you and Darren would be really good at that. I think, oh, why? And, then, and actually the whole thing, I suppose, is about the history of our organisation. We're quite contrasting as organisations with similarity is that we both work in Western Australia. And we're, um, but Vivo's history actually started out about supporting people to get home from hospital. So um, I think it's, um, we were actually called emergency housekeeping services. Um, we've never worked with in um, having facilities or group homes, which actually I think is a real strength for the organisation. Um, it's been, we haven't got caught up with congregate or institutional care or being a landlord. Um, we've been very focused about people living in their own homes and communities. We've got lots of experience, I think, about we started out with people with actually, we actually started out supporting people probably with mental health issues. It was about getting women home, so it's interesting to reflect on that. And then we've developed over the years and um, supporting a lot of older people to stay at home because so many older people end up being, um, well, I think everybody identifies their greatest wish is to stay in your own home for the whole of your life, yet so much of our community now at the moment ends up in institutional care at the end of life if they haven't got family really close around them. And of course, we've been very interested in the last really 20 years about really supporting people with disabilities to live in their own home and thinking about different models of support and, and using those with all the strengths and weaknesses to see people live at home. So what about you, Darren? Okay, so sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so our, my place's history is very similar to Avivo's. Um, just a quick history about me. So I started off as a trainee social trainer. So I worked out at one of our big hostels out at, um, in our eastern suburbs. Um, and um, through the course of about 10 or 12 years, I worked in various institutions, hostels, group homes. So I saw the... Um, um, the ways that congregate living arrangements worked. Um, I then uh, left those environments and went to work for my place, which is, as I said, is very similar to Avivo. 
So we don't provide any congregate living arrangements. It's about supporting people to live in their own home um, in the community. Um, and, and the reason that my place was set up, probably similar to um, Avivo, was because to provide an alternative to people other than a group home or a, um, a hostel type of arrangement. So, so we recognise that some people don't necessarily want to live with people with disabilities just because they've got a disability. Um, so um, the other thing to mention, and so we're the same as we're not a landlord, we support our people to be good tenants in their homes, but we made the distinction that we don't want to be their landlord, we, we provide the support that they need to live in their home. So, and, and probably we've just been pretty lucky here in WA in that we've had individualised funding that's attached to an individual and we've had that since probably the mid 2000s. So, so that's probably allowed us to do some of the stuff that we do. Um, uh, both at Avivo and at my place in our organisation. So, yeah, Darren, you started. My place was started operating about twenty five years ago, was it? Yeah, yeah, back in ninety six. So nineteen ninety six. So, so it's interesting that point. I think it was. I mean, I love my place's logo. Can you see the thing is in the name? You know, the my place, and it was yeah. very much set up, wasn't it? Was then you can see the letterbox having your own letterbox and the link yeah. between my life and my choice. So the letterbox is symbolic for us, as Rosie said, because you know a lot of people may live in a home, but they don't necessarily get their mail sent to the letterbox. It'll be sent to the head office or something like that. So, so it's quite symbolic for us to have a letterbox. And um, we did think about having a doormat, but we don't want people to be treated as doormats. So, so, so we stuck with the letterbox. And my place is the person with the disability saying, "This is my place, my home." So, <laughs> it's not the um, NDIS. <laughs> <laughs> no, very true. I don't know. In, w, in Australia, with the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I couldn't believe it when they labelled their portal as my place. And I remember, I thought, oh, poor <laughs> Darren and his colleagues. It was like yeah. nothing being tarnished with their, their poor yeah. work. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, um, uh, come this one, move on. Here we go. Um, so, the home, obviously, oh, yeah. So the um, home um, key fits in within the whole seven keys of citizenship. So, so, and, and just I'm sure people are aware. But when we talk about citizenship, we're not talking about the right to have a passport. That that's not what this is about. It's about um, being treated as an equal person with dignity and respect. And these seven keys that. Um, uh, Simon talks about is very much um, it, the, the, the interrelated with each other, but they're the foundation of someone having a, you know, being treated as a citizen in, in, in their community. So, so home fits within those seven keys. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. These are the definitions that um, um, Citizen Network put against those seven keys. They're pretty simple, but they're pretty effective and um, I think really important for us to remember um, what they're about. So, um, so when Rosie and I were putting this together, we absolutely recognised that the seven keys all interrelate with each other. So, and and you can mix them up in it whichever way you want. But you know, love and home go together. That's sharing your home with those that you love. You know, money and home, having enough money to to obtain and maintain a home, and that may include support with. Um, um, actually getting a home through um, some rent assistance or through um, low-cost um, loans so that you can purchase a home. It could also mean having enough money to purchase the supports that you need to remain living in your home. So, so that, that when we talk about money and home and how it's interrelated, that's what we're talking about there. And then help is, you know, some people may need help to live in their home. And a lot of the people that we all support, they need that help to live in their home. So, so you can see that there's an interrelationship between home and the other keys of citizenship. Yeah, and I know you guys have all looked, you've already looked at help and home, or help, haven't you, as a key? Yeah, and so I was reflecting on that. I think, you know, we're thinking about particularly that ladder that I think, um, you know, that I really like that ladder that was presented last time and actually how that applies to the kind of help. And that's um, about, you know, that when you get to the highest level about, naturally given help when both parties don't know, you don't even know or publicly put it out there. And I think actually that's some of the times when we see some of the models 
of um, people sharing homes in a deeply respectful relationship. That's some of the things we see. Um, so life and home, I mean, you know, we can see that unless you've got a home in a community, a home is not alone. It's, it's, it's um, very much how um, you're in a, you know, you're not in, uh, in a desert. So having a home within a community means that you have a, a solid foundation to actually live life and be part of it. Um, it's interesting, I think, in the past, I've seen homes being offered by the government to people that have taken them out right out of their communities or to their naturally occurring networks, um, such as their family and friends. So you know, the real need to make sure the location of the home is in the communities that people really want to live in um, is very important. Um, the other aspect of freedom and home, you know, the privacy and safety to be able to choose how you live life. Look, actually, isn't it crazy, isn't it? I know what you're saying about the signs up. But, you know, when I go home, I, when I'm in my own home, I do leave a mess. I'm not that tidy, but I'm not that tidy at work either. But it's my mess, and I choose to live like that. Um, there's other times when I'm really um, more, you know, so it's like that thing about um, cho choice to live in a way you, you want to. And it's quite interesting, I think, when we reflect some of the projections we make when people live in their homes and make them their own, how much control service providers then take again. So it's a very interesting thing to see how freedom at home is really um, supported and nurtured. And then meaning at home, you know, a home gives us so much access to be able to really fulfill our purpose. Um, you know, so there's the roles that we can take in life by having a home uh, that you feel safe in and you can live your life as you choose, means then that you can take up other roles and pursue purpose. And some people now work from home, but there's other things how they can contribute to community. And we'll talk some of that, we'll talk a bit later about some of the other roles that um, you've seen people develop by having a home. These things are the points that Simon, I think if you know the keys to citizenship he uses in his graphic, and I think they pick up some of the core elements that we're kind of touching on here. You know, so there is the aspect about the front door. Um, and how that is um, your front door and who goes in and out of it and also who you welcome into the home. And it's very much related to the freedom and control that you have in your own home. So I think you can see those are stark differences between what many people with disabilities and mental health and, and older people who live in institutional care, how that can end up being the having the front door and who opens it and who closes it, who has the key, um, who has the control to the environment. The privacy we've talked about, and I've touched on a little bit, and I think it is, it's something about the real privacy, the things that you do in your own home. Where, you know, it, it links to the key of intimate love too, the relationships, how you, you know, the privacy you have to have relationships with people that are, you know, good relationships, healthy relationships and natural um, for any people in their lives. It being a safe place. Um, you know, it's interesting to talk about. I think one of the things when we were preparing this, we really needed to think about, yes, we've seen so much abuse happen to people who live in institutional care, but we can't be naive. And we, I think both of our organisations, and I'm sure CamCam, One to One, and all, all of us, even with supporting people to live in their own home, you can see things end up happening. It's a really interesting challenge that they still can be unsafe. Um, so it could be the, the abuse they experience from people they live with, even if they might choose the family members. <laughs> it can be with someone they invite into their home, um, the people that come into their lives. Um, you know, those sorts of things are something that are quite challenging, and, but we can't be naive. Just, I, I don't think we can just assume if you've got a home in the community that you are always going to be safe, because we know that happens with everybody. There's abuse that's happening there. And then the security. I think the symbol Simon's got up here is very much about the tenancy and having the ownership. Um, actually, both my place and I think we've already touched my place in Aviva have chosen not to be landlords. Sometimes it might have been a damn sight easier. But we've decided that we really needed to be different from separate. So we're the support for home, but not necessarily the landlord, which I think the roles get quite confused. Um, around um, expectations and who's doing what. Um, 
But the security of tenancy or ownership is, is something that I see people quite vulnerable with at times. Um, you know, and if you don't, you know, um, yeah, so that's a, a, a critical, if you don't feel that you're in control of who owns the house and who's, who's got the control over it, it um, makes one very vulnerable. It worries me still that, you know, we know there's people with disabilities and mental health problems, you know, who have been evicted because they haven't been able to um, meet the expectations and haven't had the adequate support and, and, and contributed in their own way to the responsibilities. And then the other element that he's got there is the belonging. You know, we all know that it is within community and how you contribute to that. And it's also though, you can be in community, but if you have no relationships to the neighbours, to the shops, to the people around, then um, you're not really got a sense of home. So we move on to the next one. Um, this is from the keys and there's a lot of words, but I think it's worth reflecting on. We all need a place we call, we can call our home. It's not just a shelter, but a place where we can have privacy, where we can be with those we love, where we belong. When we have no home, we appear almost rootless and disconnected. When, and another point, when we say someone has gone into a home, hmm, we often mean they've lost their home. You know, it's quite, very, makes me shiver when I think about that, you know, um, how important home is and then, you know, what our society does still to lots of people. So moving on to the next slide. I was also, we were reflecting when forming this, isn't it, though, too, that, you know, we all are fairly familiar with the sort of hierarchy of needs. And, you know, when you go from the very base of it, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because actually home goes right through the hierarchy. So home, you know, it is, it's about food, water, shelter, clothing. It is also about safety, security, you know, with people. But then you get the love and belonging and the self, and self esteem and self actualization. And, but, you know, if you don't have a home or you have a place that's a shelter, but not a real home, how your access to these sorts of needs gets really impaired. Um, I think a lot of stuff in the past has been focused really for people with disabilities and mental health problems is in the two lower areas. And, um, you know, and as a result, the deeper thinking about how to create home um, hasn't, hasn't progressed. So, um, yeah, moving on. So what? What, what, what we're trying to capture there is the importance of home, and I think that, you know we, we've highlighted some of the um, the fundamental things that home can bring um, in terms of um, love and safety and security and all those things. And Simon talks about it um, in one of his presentations. In one of um, mm -hmm. when he talked about the keys of citizenship and home, and he captures it again the importance of home for people. Um, and I'll just play that for you, so. Is your volume um, up, Darren? It's not coming through, is it? No, the volume's not coming through. Find place you are. The volume is up as high as it can go. So. Um, That's why a lot of people are really passionate about saying, look, I don't... Can you hear so it? the volume not coming so, through? So, yeah, so we can hear it, but what it means, I think, is that we all need to turn our own volumes up. So if you could just take it back to the beginning, Darren, and if people could have a go, it just took, I mean, obviously be careful, but turn your I volume have to go out of this because... Um... Sorry, is... Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can't hear you guys. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Something's happened here. Okay. Just let me try that again. The fourth key Can people hear that? Hope. Yeah. Foods, having a place, having a place of your own. Um, home is actually um, so important to your soul, really, to, to being able to ground yourself, to being able to find place you are, to feel safe. Uh, that's why a lot of people are really passionate about saying, look, I don't want to live in your home, in that home, I want my own home. 
That doesn't mean you want to live alone, but it means that you're going to live with people you love, you choose, that, that you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're not feeling grumpy about the fact that you're living with this person who happens. So home is essential, I think, to citizenship. And it's essential to communicate to the other people in the physical place you are that you belong there. This is your home. You belong. You're part of that. So I think Simon captures that really well in terms of the importance of home. And um, it's a simple two minute message, but I think it really highlights um, the importance of, of home. What, what Rosie and I wanted to do now is we just wanted to, um, because we see home and community as being um, connected and linked together. So we wanted to um, hand over to you guys to tell us, um, you know, what you see as the connection between home and community. And then the second part of that, if, if, if we accept that home and community are um, um, linked together, then what are the valued roles that are made possible through living in the home in the community? So, so happy to just open it up to the, to the group and um, people can sort of chime in and give us their thoughts around those two aspects. Mm -hmm. Darren, can you just stop sharing your screen for a moment, just because then we can get everybody back in the room. And it, just in case you haven't got that in the top right hand corner, if yeah. you make sure you've got gallery view on, that means that instead of speaker view, gallery view means everybody's in the room. So you get to see everybody. Thanks, and then you can just see if people are raising their hand. So. <laughs> so where's your, th where does your thinking go when you think about those questions? Um, for me, uh, the first thing that springs to mind is the disconnection I've seen, um, especially out in the wheat belt, where, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who have been, I guess, in Perth, um, needing housing. Nothing's been available, so they've been sent out to, like, a small town. And they've got no connection to anyone in the community. Um, and, and they don't get one until something really bad happens in their mental services. Um, but they don't feel safe in their homes because, they, yeah, that, that sense of, um, I guess, feeling at home outside of their home doesn't exist. Yeah. So, you know, um, that's when you, you know, when you talk about connection to home and community, you can see it is really important to adding to that being safe and feeling at home within your house. Yeah, I, I agree. It's actually quite a thing with public policy, isn't it? That, you know, so you get a house, but you're in a community you've got no connection from, and actually a long way from your natural supports, where your family or the things that you're interested are. You know, I've seen that you, know, you say they move out to Meriden or Makamburin or um, some remote town, and then, um, and actually, but it even happens, you know, even with the context of the city, you know. People get housing right out on the outer rim of the city where there's not with the less infrastructure and connection to people. What other things that that's really helpful, Jules? Bridget. Bridget. Um, I was just thinking about the other bit about connection to communities as um, from home and communities. There's actually a lot of choice around that. So you can have a home and be safe and then you can make some decisions about how much more you can be connected to communities. So whether or not you do know your neighbours, whether or not you branch out and become wider. So there's a whole level of, I guess, um, a spectrum of choice around how connected to community you are as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's... Um... You, you, you know, it's like all of us, we make a choice about how much we want to be connected with our community. But I think the, the, the thing we're trying to capture is that unless you're in a home within the community, those things are less likely to happen in terms of making that choice. So, which is important. Isn't it, the other thing I was reflecting on, how this is going back in time, but you know how people didn't want people, like, so you know how I can remember the stuff around people getting, building group homes in communities, and how then there was the, the, the push that community members didn't want them there. Mm. Um, fortunately, when people get their own homes, there's not necessarily then a, a street um, 
I hope there isn't. Do you experience that? Is people experience anything where people get their own home and they're in a, in a community and then our neighbours say they don't want them to be living there? And talk about that, Katrina. Rachel has you had your yeah. hand up. I don't know if yeah. that relates directly, but I just know that you put your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. So just before we jump on to what Rosie just introduced, I just wanted to share what I was reflecting on um, and this discussion around home and community and how they connect um, made me think back to so previous to working in the disability sector, I worked in the youth sector and I was involved in working on a project with young people who'd experienced homelessness and they were involved in putting together a phot uh, photographic exhibition on what home meant to me. The project was called Home is Where My Heart Is. So these young people would get mentoring um, from photographers and to produce a bunch of images about what home meant to them and what, um, and what they wanted to share about what home was. Um, and rarely would the images be of an actual house or a bricks and mortar structure, that the images were all around people, places in the community that they felt safe and accepted. So it was really, you know, all um, places that held particular memories that they evoked from a good time in their life. So this to me is making me think very much of that as, um, you know, obviously not exactly the same group we're talking about, but a group of people who have been isolated and, you know, left out of society. But what home meant to them was not this bricks and mortar structure, but was, I guess, these elements which we could call community. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to share that because that really, for me, ties in very nicely with this conversation. Yeah, Rachel, just following on from it, there was a fantastic exhibition down in um, the Maritime Museum down in Fremantle, kids that were in um, the child protection area, so they were under um, care and protection of the um, state government, and they did a photographic exhibition as well. And the three things that came out of that photographic exhibition was nothing to do with houses, it was to do with people, place and purpose and people being pets and all that sort of stuff. So it was about that stuff as opposed to what did the house look like? <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, just reinforcing that point. Yeah. Bev, you put your hand up? Um, so, you know, my background is um, South African. And for me, it brings back very sad memories of the majority of the population being underprivileged and driving along the streets when we all live in our beautiful homes made of bricks and mortar and these people on the streets in tin shanties actually coming into the community not to connect with us but actually to steal from us because that's all they knew. They were actually out there just to survive, to provide for their families and that was their home but that wasn't connecting. Very, very sad situation. And unfortunately, it still exists there. And we, as a, as a family, myself and my, my family, we're very lucky that we've moved on to this beautiful country where at least there are opportunities for underprivileged people to connect and have a home. Mm. Food for thought. Mm. I um, think... It is interesting and lovely to hear about that artwork, Rachel, and your points, Darren. And it is interesting, though, that we've, it's like a combination of the factors, isn't it? You know, we know if you haven't got a place <laughs> and we know all the issues around still, you know, we are a very privileged country, but at the same time, there's, there's people that can't get homes <laughs> and, um, and maintain homes um, or have to wait for years for it and then live on the, you know, end up homeless. So the combination of factors are really important, but one element in itself is not sufficient. Mm. Do you think we, is there any things around the other question about the roles that are made possible that may be reflecting on people, some of the examples you've seen people because they have had real homes in community where they've actually really um, found purpose, maybe that's a good way of framing it, or found a role that 
has really been very important to them. Um, I did some work with a, a man um, a few years ago who had always lived with families um, and he, he referred to himself as, as a boy. Uh, you know, he would, would have been in his late 40s, early 50s and very um, just wanting to please everyone all the time and I guess that's the insecurity isn't it, of you know, if I don't do what other people want I'm going to lose my home. So um, it was really wonderful to be able to help him to move into his own home and to see the change that that made um, for him, to see him to start referring to himself as a good man and um, to, be, to start getting involved in the community. And um, from there, um, some, some work as well. So that was really life changing for him. It's a really good point. So, did he get his own home, Jules? Um, he was renting, but yes, he was he was um, living on his own. He decided that he didn't really like to live on his own, but then that was just a matter of finding him a roommate, mm. um, which which we did, and they got up to some hijinks. But you know, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, but it, it really did. It just shifted that thinking for him in that he went from being a boy who stayed always with people and needed to be looked after and to please people to being, you know, someone that was um, accepted in his community, who had a job and who was doing things that men would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're raising a really good point that worries. So, you know, we, I think, well, both, well, the Bevo does, and I'm just, my place also uses a model where we support people to live in family homes which is interesting, that thing around the security and when, when is that appropriate? And I think it's tapping into what you're saying, Katrina, around when is it the right time to move on um, from that. And one of the problems that sometimes we see with that model is the family who's hosting them will keep on wanting them to be there for some of their own reasons, whether that's financial or, also the, or sometimes it's actually just letting go mm. of that person because there's a time and a place when you, um, it's, it's not, yeah, so I think you've tapped into something that is, I think, a real issue sometimes with the transition from people who live within a family setting and then moving into um, their own place with all that responsibility and then chaos sometimes that goes with it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other examples of roles or purpose that you've seen? Rachel? So I have an example um, relating to a gentleman that I've worked alongside for probably about three years now. Um, he always had his own home. He was in a, a Homes West unit and always had his own home. When I started working with him, however, he didn't very much feel safe in his own home um, and didn't go out very often, didn't like people coming to his place when he had to go out. He would tuck a piece of fabric over the corner of the door when he closed it because, you know, if he'd come back and the fabric had fallen down, he'd know someone, you know, he was quite um, anxious about this idea of safety and security. Um, and it wasn't till we started working around connecting to the community. And this was a long time, you know, this was a, <laughs> three years of, <laughs> process um however he now is very connected to his community as part of a couple of groups in terms of hobbies he's part of a stamp club he's part of a camera club he attends some social groups um, he's even started hosting his own social group because he found that there wasn't enough in his very immediate area um, but with all that and the more that he started connecting he no longer sort of booby traps his home when he goes out. Um, you know, I come and, you know, the doors aren't, you know, five different locks on the doors. He keeps his home much more tidy. And so for him, the thing that was missing was that community connection that we're talking about is that he goes to his local shops 
and you know it takes us forever just to duck into the shops to pick up some milk because he's chatting you know the cafe owners he's on a first name basis with and all these people so you know and I'm extremely proud of what he's achieved there but for him it wasn't just this idea of having the home but it was missing this connection in terms of what was for him to feel safe and comfortable and I guess as things have grown he now has this role of a community connector in that in this social group that he hosts um, which he's doing independently now and very successfully so yeah for him that was the missing element is it wasn't just having the own home but as, as you were we've been talking about too is is it's this connection to community as well. Yeah, brilliant example, lovely. And the work it took to get that connection mm. is a real example to many of us, I think. <laughs> it was a long time and it took a lot, but I'm so very, very proud of what he has achieved. And I think back to when I started working with him or people who knew him then, and they said he, they say he's a different man and he really is mm. fantastic. Well, I think that's an important point because um, certainly I hope what Rosie and I are saying today doesn't just give people the impression that if you put people in the community, it will happen. It, it, for some people, it doesn't. And you know, we, a lot of us have probably been involved in closing down um, institutions and then people moving out into the community. And, and that, that can take a lot of support and work and um, thinking stuff through. Um, you know, we've got a, a big institution here in WA that's at the end of closing down Paraquat and um, another organisation Rosie and I are involved in. We, we're acutely aware of some of the challenges that um, those people are having to move into um, the community, you know, home in the community, because they've lived in this place for a long time. It's familiar. It's all of those things. So, so we're not suggesting just put people in the community and it, and it will happen. It, it requires some effort and some work for some people. But what we are saying is that um, the likelihood of it succeeding will happen if it's a, a natural home in the community, I suppose that's what we're trying to say. But Rachel, your point is well made. You know, um, it, it requires some effort for some of our people for that to occur, so. Mm -hmm. It reminds me also that I think, Kate, you've been talking about, and you guys might have, I think, been, it's like having a house is only one half of the ladder, <laughs> or not even half, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. It is important, um, but um, and actually, I was reflecting too. I'm not sure how well our system in the past has been really. But I think the thing about supporting people to really feel at home in their communities is a skill set that we haven't been particularly great. We focus so much more on the house and the support. Yeah. Bridget, Bridget, you had your hand up. I'm not sure I'm going to articulate this very well, but um, just when I was listening about this kind of role thing, as um, I've supported a lady um, in the distance, she's, I'm not directly, who's a young lady who was living on the streets in Perth and was homeless, um, has a very poor connection with her family, and has a child and that's now with child protection, so she's got very few um, kind of solid relationships around her. And interestingly enough, um, she's now got a home in the community and, um, you know, she celebrates that, but she continually brings other homeless people into her tenancy, which jeopardises her tenancy. But in fact, you can see that she's actually trying to, I'm just thinking about that role around contribution and support. She's stepping up into that, which actually is a, quite a beautiful role, except for that it's kind of challenging for to support her with a whole range of... Um, People that come with their own challenges into the into the home as well, and often jeopardises her. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because that um, interesting. It's like the way our system works and the controls that we have around tenancy. I was actually your point, Bridget, brought to mind a woman that we support up in the Midwest, and she's an Indigenous woman, and she's the she's the matriarch, and there's lots of complexity both around the supports and what happens in the home. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, she's in public housing too. And then um, navigating all that is, um, is so important. I mean, and I do actually think it's really helpful to hang on to the roles that she has. She is the matriarch, she's grandmother, she's mother. Um, 
And, you know, but, I, but I've, over the years, I've seen us struggle with that line, you know, especially when you get into some of the other things we've talked, you know, when it's a workplace. Yeah. <laughs> and the safety issues. And the, yeah. yeah. Shall we move on? Yeah. We'll just go back to the slides. So, so what we um, wanted to talk about is um, just based on um, our experience, Rosie and um, my, Vivo and my place's experience, that for people with disability, um, I, a home or a house or can come in many, many different guises and it hasn't always been um, the, uh, I've just got to shift this, that's better. Um, it hasn't always been um, um, the best environment for people to live in. So, so we're all aware of institutions and group homes and cluster living and social housing and, you know, so social housing um, here in Australia, as well as I'm sure in other countries, is, a, is a, um, a complex issue for governments to grapple with. And, you know, I'm aware of this concept in the UK called Four Doors, where they're trying to have a mix of social housing who lives in those type of environments, and yet they still have what they call Four Doors, where the, um, the people who are um, deemed to be... Um, Beneficiary, beneficiary, beneficiaries of social housing have to use a separate door to the other tenant. So, is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, Talk in the apartment group. building, they use a separate door. Yes. Over the places where the social housing is versus yes. entry into the rest of the apartment. Is that how it works? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So, if you if you Google poor doors UK, you will come up with some of these um examples. So. Um, it, it, our experience here in Australia is that there's a perception that individualised support is deemed too expensive by funders, certainly not by people like, you know, Bridget, Rosie and myself. We don't think it's too expensive. Um, a lot of the funding models perpetuate some of this stuff. So previously, we, you, you're, you were allocated funding based on four people living together. And, and, and your housing and support was always tied together. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, but again, it's, um, it, it's another um, contingency you've got to think about when you're trying to pull stuff together. It does so, really, um, Darren, isn't it though? It, and I've seen, and you've um, worked in this, that when you've got the combination of things, the individual, what's good for an individual always gets compromised. Yes, absolutely. Because of the group. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 you know, people say, oh, look, you can run really good situations in group living. Oh, I think that's damn hard to do. <laughs> and, yes. um, you know, it, look, we've had a couple, we don't have any group, we don't have any group living. But we've, we've got, we've got, we've supported a couple of people who have got, they have a relationship with someone else with a disability and also have their own funding. Um, and it's interesting, as soon as that kind of gets tied up together, how yeah. to really make sure you're making, um, of working well so each person lives well and having yes. in their life well together. I think it's um, housing and support tied together and then as soon as you get a group, it's just you know, really hard. Um, yeah. And particularly if that group comes together purely based on that they've all got a disability, not that they want to come together. So really in reality, that is how it is generally, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the other thing is lack of choice and control, you know, who I live with, where I live. And, and then, as Rosie said, sharing of resources, you know, if um, one person leaves a group home, um, you know, that can cause all sorts of difficulties and often the, um, the group home provider may try and keep that person for perhaps not the right reasons because the funding is, um, you know, the most important thing. Um, you know, sharing of staff and, and sharing of equipment, which, um, you know, and sometimes very personal equipment that um, you have to share. So often, um, so where, where I previously worked, um, the bricks and mortar and how the place looked was more important than what happened in the place. 
So it, it, these group homes we worked in were absolutely beautiful group homes, but seriously, they looked like a display home every single day. There was no papers left out or anything. And I thought, this is unnatural how um, th th these are looking. But from an organisational point of view, it was important that we put on our, you know, best foot forward and it looked like a display home rather than that. So this is a big one um, where staff needs versus the person needs and, and how you um, strike that balance. Often um, with people with disability, um, the staff needs will outweigh their needs. And... Um, and, and that will always compromise the person. So, you know, it's a workplace first and it's home second. And, and absolutely appreciate you've got to strike a balance there, but um, when you've got environments that look like workplaces, act like workplaces, then the staff needs are going to um, um, overrule that. So, and then there's a risk um, of service capture. As I said, you know, people won't leave group homes because um, the, the, the group home needs the funding to support to survive and support. So, whereas if you have individualised arrangements, um, if the person leaves, you know, you, you simply look at supporting another person, the next person. So, so you're not dependent upon that person staying with you. So, um, so again, the, the, the ability to create a home is difficult in those type of situations. I'm wondering, just before, I'm curious with the group, as it is, how many of you will have worked in um, in group settings? Yeah, Bridget, you have. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, you have Katrina. Yeah. So it would be interesting for you to, if, if you've got anything to add to those things about what you can see from, from your own experience. Um. Um. I myself found it very difficult to work in a group home setting when I was working for an agency in Perth, hence why I ended up finishing up with them. Because, um, like you were saying, Darren, it was it was so it was out in the community and it was a normal looking house on the outside, but it was so institutionalised on the inside that everybody had such a routine. Um, the, the staff ultimately made their choices as to what people would be doing in the day, depending on what the staff wanted to do during the day. Um, and it was just like we'd plant, uh, transplanted an institution into a little home and called it something different, really. Um, and it, it, it just wasn't a level of support I was comfortable with, with working in. So I left that and sort of went into the more the community services side of things. But the, the level of subtle power that you see in those situations, and it can become incredibly dangerous depending on the mix of staff that you have in um, those places and also the motivations as to why they're working in, in, in those sort of settings. It's very interesting for me. Mm. Mm. And Katrina, sometimes it's not so subtle either, the power balance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be, I think uh, it's a little bit more dangerous when it is subtle because you can call out violence yeah. or aggression True. when you True. see the psychological mix and um, control over people. That was really quite distressing mm. to see that. It's interesting though, isn't it, like the stuff about the, the funding, um, on one of our calls, um, Silvana, who was on and was pretty distressed, the, the, the topic was about money, and even if we look at something like the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which, you know, by most um, Western world standards is pretty contemporary, you know, it's a, um, a fairly um, ambitious scheme, but fundamentally, within it it's worked out there's like such a strong assumption that people will will live in group living and you know all of the kind of funded allocation and the line items are based on or certainly if you look at the cell is based on the assumption that people will live with others it's 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 become a battle and we're only what four years five years down the line it's become a battle already oh. to challenge that assumption and challenge that allocation which is pretty extraordinary given the day and age Mm. That something so contemporary can be riddled with some really old assumptions. Yeah, I think we're in real danger at the moment that because they've treated, treated the NDIS as a market, mm. um, that the what we know, we who, who, who worked in this place, um, about what happens to people in congregate, but it's like it's become the, the why individual um, ownership and home and community and citizenship is so important is, is a real danger. 
Um, so, um, yeah, it's a very interesting time to see um, how, how, I mean, look, I know there's, there's organisations in Perth who are really investing in a sort of dressed up cluster situations where multiple people are going to be housed on sites, all who have disabilities. So it's something we're going to really have to watch out for. Mm. So we were just conscious of the time. So we were going to ask what, what are some of your thoughts around creating a home, but um, I'm going to give you a break. And here's a list that Rosie and I prepared <laughs> earlier on if you like. So th th these are fairly basic but important things. So, you know, as Rosie mentioned at the beginning, one of the, our symbol is the letterbox. Um, we, we could have had a key because we make sure that everyone we support um, has the keys to their front door, back door, whatever door, and that they hold those keys. You know, a letterbox which actually receives mail. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was going to say, Darren, wasn't that? I think it's a great symbol, but isn't it how now it's, I don't actually look in my letterbox. No, <laughs> it's actually having your own email and computer at home that makes it uh, that you get your mail from. Yeah, it might, a letterbox may not be as contemporary now as what it, what it was back in the mid 90s. So, um, just no uniforms, um, staff wearing uniforms. Um, Bridget, I think or someone mentioned earlier, you know, not having stuff pinned on the wall or rotor or roster or other service instructions. You know, there's there's other ways you can get information about a person's support needs without having stuff pinned on a wall and or on a fridge or something like that. Fine. One of the things I know that when we, um, you know, so I think it's a real challenge for, for us at Avivo when we're supporting people that quite often it's suddenly you, if, if I if I visit a house, or visit a person. And actually, that's one of the other things I hear in Avivo that always is, I think, a continuing challenge. When we start talking about people as homes mm. rather than people, then that's something that's saying um, something different. Yeah. It's something I think we need to challenge. Um, and so it's interesting. As soon as you see, and I, it sounded like, Bridget, it's a challenge too, you know, that suddenly you start, it's, it's this understanding, isn't it, that as soon as you start writing instructions up on a sign, mm -hmm. uh, what is that telling you about how that home is operating? Yes. And, you know, these are well-intentioned people. It's just, you know, you, it, it, it's, it's not a big leap. It's just a slippery slope that you can end up on. So it's, con it's important we're conscious about that stuff. The home looks like other homes in the street fits in. Um, um, I, I think Rosie captured it earlier about what her home and, um, you know, so people have their own belongings, smells, themes. So you walk in there and you can feel that this is this person's home. It's not, um, you know, as I said, those group homes I worked in, they were beautiful display homes, but yeah, I would have had no idea who actually lived in those homes. So the person controls a remote for the TV, very important. <laughs> you know, so it's not the staff deciding what TV stations you watch or what music you listen to or whatever. The support provider is as invisible as possible. Not being naive here to, you know, that the support provider, organisation, whoever that may be, is just, you know, not, not there. We, people need support to live in their homes and in the community, but just to be as invisible as we possibly can. So that then the person's own personality and home and, and that sort of stuff comes through rather than the support provider. The person agrees to whomever is in the home being there. That goes with the staff that they employ, but also who they live with and who comes to visit, etc. So, and then the tenure of the home is not dependent upon others. So, again, as I mentioned, those examples around funding for group homes or more than one person living together, if that person moves out, they don't lose their home or their home is not at risk of um, not, not existing beyond um, the funding, etc. So, fundamental things we know, but I think really important things. And... Um, you know, it, it's, it's a reminder about how you can create a home. And that's why we wanted to just pop those in there. So, so what, what, what we wanted to share is just some of the approaches that Avivo and my place um, take in terms of trying to create this um, um, sense of having a home in the community. Um, and um, we've been doing this over a number of years and we've been doing it because we, we, we didn't want to provide congregate arrangements. So, so Rosie, I might hand over to you if you wanted to talk about some of these and then I'll jump yeah. in. Yeah, so actually, um, I mean, I think we're very, I mean, 
I think you all know of these things, these arrangements. And, and knowing a number of you in the room, Zoom room today, you um, are fairly, really, fairly familiar with a range of things that our organisations, but also other organisations in Perth, Australia, the world, have been thinking about when you when you think about individualised support and people being living in community. Um, I think that we have seen the benefit of some of the ho this idea of host arrangements. Now they have all sorts of names. Um, but um, so, you know, in the idea actually there's, there's a very naturally occurring thing that has merged with older people. So, you know, it's quite natural for people to think as they age, um, they have a house of their own, maybe their partner has died. If they had a partner, their family's moved on and looking at an arrangement where they need some support and they can be, they are a householder and how they share their home as a home sharer and actually provide a home to somebody else. So we've certainly experimented with that with older people. Um, we've also endeavoured um, with, the, and that's a naturally given relationship. Sometimes it is just, there's no money exchanged. It's really um, somebody providing a home and somebody else moving in and it's um, clarified and, and can be wonderful to seeing an older person be able to continue to stay at home for much longer because they haven't got family around them or anymore. Um, we've taken some of these ideas into disability work too. Um, probably a bit harder to achieve um, on a naturally occurring relationship um, because of the level of support and maybe the power that the person has as being a householder. So I've been sometimes been trying to do that um, initial model quite challenging, but then we've also, um, you know, certainly um, been, you know, we certainly have seen that you can, with perseverance, can really get that to work out. So that certainly with the idea that um, the, the um, person who is, the person who's requiring the support is also the householder and has someone to come into their home to share it. We also have um, arrangements which we, um, where it's more like the supporter is um, the person is a host, it, it moves into the home of a host. That might be a family. You see that very naturally occurring with the idea of how people move into foster homes. Um, it can be appropriate within adult life, but it's something that I think that, and we have seen people being supported within host arrangements, living in the home of the family um, very well as adults um, and with deep respect. But it's something that I think we also need to really look out into the future about um, how that is really working for the person with the disability in the long term. Um, Darren, I might would talk with your the, the things about co-resident. It's really where where someone moves into the home of a person and there is a salaried arrangement. Is that how you clarify it too? You need your, your mic off. You need your mic. You need to come off mute. So it's the um, the, the person with a disability or the customer, um, client, consumer. It's their home, and then someone comes and um, shares their home with them, um, and then they 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 paid a salary to um to to live to share their life with them, if you like. So mm -hmm. yeah. Again, um, because so, it's interesting as. You know, Kate said that, you know, the NDIS by any Western standards will be a contemporary model of um, support for people with disabilities, yet these arrangements 20 odd years down the track, Vivo and My Place and others, we're having to fight to sort of maintain and keep these arrangements because the government trying to get their head around them is, is they're finding it a bit difficult at the moment. So, um, but anyway. Yeah. Um, li living alone, that's simply someone that chooses to live on their own. Um, they, they may need drop-in support, um, mentor support, um, they may need just some personal assistance support for them to maintain um, you know, living on their own. So, so when, when we were working with the NDIS around this, they were quite challenged by that. Why would anyone want to live on their own? And the number of people we know, they, they just want to live on their own. <laughs> and it doesn't mean they're lonely, it just means that they want to live on their own. So. Um, so that was um, interesting um, how they did that. And then living together, as it says, you, you choose who you want to live with, be a husband, wife, brother, sister, couple of mates, but you're not, you're not coming together just because you've got a disability, you're coming together because you want to share your home with that person, so. Yeah, the thing to watch with this is that the, within the Australian context is 
they be, the NDIS begins to think of that as um, impacting on the person's funding. Mm. So naturally given support, because you live with somebody, is then part of the formula for deciding how much support they will get. Yeah. Um, which I think is something um, really um, tricky. <laughs> um, I mean, I've seen, we've supported people that might, may have been mothers who have their sons and daughters living with them and then they move out and move back in again and um, things change and, you know, it seems, yeah, really, um, you know, it is saying that the NDIS is saying it, you know, it's the person's responsibility, the support organisation's responsibility is to keep on letting the NDIS know when those support arrangements change. So, mm. um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting course to follow through with some of these things. Over, I mean, I think we know lots of people. I mean, if I think about Avivo, we've got a small number in the, um, relatively smaller numbers in the host arrangements and co-residents. We support lots of people who live alone, mm. um, but and also quite a, quite a quite a lot of people who live together in naturally occurring relationships. Mm. Um, and yeah, really reinforced, Darren, isn't it? That experience that we're all probably having about how do we help the NDIS as the funder to understand it. Mm. Um, and um, I think it's going to be something that we've got to really work together and advocate for because um, the dominance thing around group living and market is mm. uh, pushing us in, in another direction. Yeah, the, you know, the just to give you a time, sorry, just to give you a time check in, it's quarter past 10. Okay. Thanks. Just to, um, yeah, you know, the danger is that a naturally occurring relationship, a husband or a wife, um, we don't want that to shift to being that you're their carer, in a sense. So, so that's a challenge for us with the NDIS about how we um, navigate our way through that. So, but, and, and I think just to reinforce Rosie's point from earlier, we're not saying that these are also risk-free. Um, you know, bad things can happen in these arrangements as well. So we've got to be ever vigilant around these things. But we just, we fundamentally believe that these type of arrangements, that the, the risks, are, um, the potential risk or harm to a person is less likely to occur. But again, it's, we're not naive to think that it won't occur. So we've got to be always vigilant around these and make sure that we're um, maintaining people's um, safety and um, dignity and all that sort of stuff so and then just what what is the foundation of your own home is that it's in the community you have dominion over it and then it's, it's your choice and control around a number of aspects who comes to live with you who comes to support you all of those sorts of things so so what we wanted to do now is we just wanted to share with you a couple of examples um, of citizenship in action, if you like. So where, where all of the stuff we've spoke about and the approaches that Aviva and My Place take and, and where, they've, um, um, where they actually occur. Um, so we just wanted to sh share two stories. Um, they're short, um, you know, three minutes. Um, so Robert and Gareth's story. So Robert um, lived in um, institutions for about 40 years. Um, wanted to move out and um, uh, I think a couple of things happened there. One is um, no one was listening to him <laughs> and the second thing is no one thought he could move out. He has um, a physical and intellectual disability and, um, and until somehow he, he came across one of our organisations, we listened to him and, and we kind of made it happen. So, so this is um, just a, a quick little video um, capturing Robert. Just um, due to Robert's um, disability, he, he does um, have difficulty with reading, so he does snort a little bit. Um, so just bear that in mind while you're watching it. So let's hope this works. I may need to... I can hear it, but I can't see it. I can't see it.
Can people see and hear that? You know what, Darren? I reckon no. we we'll can the link to people, um, yep. given the time, and maybe just flick over to the other example. It's a yep. lovely little video, so maybe we can send it afterwards to participants. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just got to try and stop it now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So then the other um, example we wanted to share is a guy called Gareth, uh, lived in a group home for a number of years and has now been supported to move into his own home in the community. Again, um, a couple of reasons Gareth didn't live in his own home was people didn't think he could because of his level of disability. Um, and the level of support that he needed. And, um, you know, we, we listened to him and um, he's now living um, in his own home in the community. Um, and and the, the, the quotes that are written up there are from his mum, um, you know, who, who thanks the staff for enriching his life beyond his wildest dreams. But it just talks about some of the stuff that he's involved in. You know, he's part of a local dog walking group. Um, through that connection with the dog walking group, three neighbours now come to visit him. He has friends in the neighbourhood. He joined the local men's um, group. Um, he, he still has to maintain some um, therapy support. So he does it now with proper exercises following the staff being trained. Um, he's been to Bunnings. He's setting up a small garden where he will share his produce with local people. It's fantastic. And he, he loves to give. So his mum's... Um, and Gareth are, are, are very happy now that um, he's done that. So again, um, just an example of how people can move from places they used to live uh, in the community and then the things that can happen um, if you have a home in the community with someone who's got a, a fairly significant disability. So, Brilliant. so and we'll share, I'll share that link of, about Robert's story um, as well, for people who are interested in having a look at that. So. Mm. And I know in the work of various organisations, I think it, you know, it always makes me feel you've got to keep your eye on the big picture and what can be achieved. And that's a beautiful example, seeing those, those things. Aaron? So, I think we've come to the conclusion. Yeah. And uh, really keen to check in with you and reflect, get your final reflections before we finish up. I mean, I'm happy to, to start. The thing that the big headline that's just rolling around my head at the minute is, you know, the image you showed of Maslow's hierarchy and how, and the kind of connection between home and love, home and purpose, like home is, I suppose that, that's the big headline that's running through my head, how much home kind of is the foundation, but also the ladder throughout it all and uh, and probably just because of where my head's at this morning I suppose I'm just really thinking and deeply and sadly about the experience in the UK and how displaced people are without a home and how displaced how can you build a life without a foundation I suppose and then I, the other bit that runs in my head is the, the challenge around I also know that there's the traveling community who you know don't have bricks and mortar who have a very different way of living but but again the community is there so mm -hmm. so yeah that's probably the big headline for me and the other bit that really stood out for me was in the film that you showed around Simon when he said a home is also a physical representation to everybody else that this is where I belong and that feels really close to my heart at the minute because I've moved home and I'm trying to connect and build with the community and how yeah how just incredible that is to your soul I think so um so yeah that's the, the kind of big headline for me so thank you anyone else Bridget um we're trying to run some um training at Cam Can around my home your workplace and I've been working with a particular family around some of the things you were talking around uh, privacy but having support staff come in and behave in not so pleasant ways and leave that house and I guess just some of the stuff that you spoke about today you know around um, 
uh, you know, as a tool, how do we get get people to connect to what home is for them? That is a really good training strategy for how to respect somebody else's home. You know, and, and when they walk in as a support worker, recognizing that it actually begins as an intrusion, even though they come with good heart and good intent. I think that's a really good point. You know, when the slide came up for creating my home, I actually felt really sad because, you know, if I think about doing that for me, um, some of those things, while they're important, they wouldn't even occur to me because they're, you know, they're just not a factor in my life. And I, Kate, I'm, I'm looking at moving um, towards the end of the year and so I'm going to be, I guess, having to find a new community and and um, while I know I won't lose friends, you, you know, you always make new friends where you move to. But so I have those, I have those choices. And when we talk about choice for people to be able to make connections, how much real choice do they have to build a community without support? So I guess when we're looking at supporting people to stay in their home or to get a home, you know, the big thing is how are we going to connect people to their community? so that they have a real sense of home. Lots to think about, <laughs> as always. Rachel? Yeah, I think I'm thinking of the same slide that Jules was reflecting on in, in terms of that list of creating a home particularly in a service environment. Um, and I did sort of a mental checklist of my head of the clients who I'm currently supporting and working alongside right now about how many of them actually would have a home with those elements in. And that seems to be the people who do, um, you know, it's the exception, you know. Um, so on the whole, you know, there are, it is the service environment and the workplace, um, you know, and there's a particular, just last week, I had a particular conversation with a, with, um, a client's staff members at their home um, around, you know, um, this person who really likes being outside, like to spend time in their closed courtyard. They've now redone the courtyard and put wood in the garden and because he was putting them in his mouth he's no longer allowed to go spend time in the courtyard and I said why not just remove the wood chips <laughs> and take them off the garden bed rather than locking him out of the courtyard and they thought it wasn't my place to say that or ask that question I don't really mind I'm gonna ask that question um but yeah it, it's this, these, and I, I guess it is difficult because I come into someone's home and often there are other support staff from other agents, you know, so it's that balancing act of how we all work together. But yeah, a, a lot of the times it is, you do feel really disheartened when you, you know, come in and you see what's going on and you work with that person for so long, but then, then you leave and, and go away and you know that, you know, that's meant to be their home, but that's where they're staying. Mm. Steve? Okay, yeah, this has been really interesting. I, I think in, in the UK, we've, we've managed to do quite a lot of good things um, with um, getting uh, people um, into um, accommodation that really works for them and um, enabling them to learn to like the place where they live and providing them with support to travel and those kinds of things. I think where we're now kind of completely stalling is about those people who are more challenging um, and uh, are proposals and policies to try and make progress in that just seem to be stalling uh, and part of that is about how can you get enough expertise um, to work in, in that kind of um, small home situation um, because 
the model we've evolved is one in which um, it usually has a minimum kind of staffing level of, of people who are on the most basic of salary. Um, and so it's just kind of trying to take that forward at the same time as we also have um, uh, pretty much a shortage of housing um, and actually increasing numbers of people without disabilities ending up homeless and sleeping on the streets and, and, and stuff like that. So it, it's kind of having had 25, 30 years of some quite su successful uh, moving people out of institutions and, and getting people their own home, we seem to be really running into some difficulties now about how do you make that, that next stage happen for the people who, who have the greatest challenges. Really helpful for me, Steve, anyway, because I think I, I can see, well, there's lots of um, scenarios I can think of right now where I think that is a real challenge. I think it is really tricky. I, 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 there's a couple of scenarios that are popping into my head around people who do it really well, um, who have things like individual service designs, who have things like individual working policies, and but it's rare and it, it's... Yeah, it's really significant. Um, and I wonder about a kind of systemic response to that anyway. So that's really helpful for me, for me thinking about that. Katrina, do you have your hand up? I think for me, um, the home in particular is, is uh, great timing. Um, but also having a home for people is not just about having the physical, the bricks and mortar. But it's essentially about belonging somewhere and to someone. Um, and in that, um, your, your connections to your community, to your inner circle, to the people that um, are in your life, brings about a, a natural reciprocation when you have a home and you have a base. Um, you know, you, you are automatically a neighbour to someone and there's opportunities to share yourself and also for your neighbours to share themselves with you in terms of walking their dog, looking after the house when they go away, um, you know, and, and the roles around um, being in a safe place where you're recognised, um, particularly what I've seen is incredibly important for people in um, their recovery process. Um, I think reciprocation a lot of the time is not something we talk about and how important it is for people who are service users, hate that word, um, to actually be able to reciprocate outside of services in their normal community and what that actually does for people in terms of their healing and, and having a home is the first step in that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Thanks, Katrina. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to stop because we're at time. Um, thank you, Darren. Thank you, Rosie. The, the words that are kind of swirling around my head is kind of thinking about home is almost like profoundly simple, but then profound. So there's, there's something just, uh, I, don't, I don't know. And I found it quite emotional, I think. I don't know why, but um, yeah, thank you so much. It's been really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody said before, food for thought. Um, and thank you. everybody else. Sorry, go on, Rosie. No, I just want to say thank you for everybody. It's been a, a really um, enjoyable hour and a half um, and um, really good to connect with this material. So thanks for the opportunity. And ditto from me. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you, Rosie and Abibo, for hosting me I'm over <laughs> at, their, at their digs, at their home today. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. It's Thanks, Darren. So our next session's two weeks time, 6th of June, and we're focused on the key around life. And we've got Nick Macy, who um, is the founder of Befriend here in uh, Western Australia, who has used to be the participant here, so you'll recognise him. And a guy called Richard Orr, who's a colleague of Rachel's, who's a pretty cool and interesting bloke. And I reckon we'll be in for an interesting session then. Um, so... Yeah, join us again. Hope to see you again, um, Steve, because I think that session is early morning as well, early morning for us, <laughs> late for you. But uh, we really appreciate your contribution and really appreciate you being here. So, um, okay, thank you, everybody. Yeah. See you next time. Bye-bye. See ya. Thanks. <laughs>